Well, welcome back into another of the Gym Sport Go podcast. This time I'm joined by a man who's made a huge name for himself in Britain, uh, former Auckland and Blues coach, Pat Lamb. Uh, Pat, wonderful to have your company, mate. And uh, how, are you, how are you coping uh, in this, uh, this COVID-19 lockdown? Yeah, it's not too bad. Obviously, first and foremost, we know, um, you know, the whole world is facing challenges. We all know that, you know, people are affected in one way or the other and, you know, and our prayers and, and thoughts go out to everything that's going around you. Um, but ultimately, what it has done is bring a real focus to the, the most important things in your life, you know, and, you know, and obviously it's family for me, it's, it's faith, family um, and, and health and making sure we're okay. So it's been great. I mean, uh, my oldest son is back in New Zealand in Auckland there. Um, we brought our son. Our second son was in Ireland, so he's managed to get over here before the lockdown. Um, and the younger two children are here, and my oldest daughter is in her flat with her flatmates about 2K away. So um, we're healthy and we're good and we're safe, and um, so it's all good. And the only issue is this um, our team, you know, to help the NHS, they, I mean, the National Health Service here doing an unbelievable job, just like they are all around the world. And to the team, did a shave or grow. It's normally shave your head off, but we're conscious with social distancing. We didn't want to encourage guys to go to barbers and go out and get shavers. So I've gone for the grow. So I've never had a long, a full bed. And I've realized all the grays coming through, but I uh, <laughs> could end up a little bit like Tom, Tom Hanks at the end of this, if it keeps on going for very long. <laughs> Mate, the worst thing that's happened in our house is that the kids have got very good at the board games and the old man's getting a hiding most of the time that we play now. Mate, I'm still the same, mate. They never let them win. And if they do win, I, I, I tell them I let them win. Yeah, I'm, I try to do the same. And when I can, I cheat as much as I can. Absolutely as much as I can. Hey, how, how how's it been as a coach? Like, have you been able to be in much contact with your players? Are you able to know whether they're staying fit and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the big thing that we did, and it's no different um, from anything in life, is having a plan. So when we... Um, we were we were going really well. We were five games on the trot. We finished playing Harlequins on the Sunday. Everyone had a week off, so they all went off around the world and different places for a holiday for the break. As we come in, it was probably going to be our last break before the big run-in because we had European quarters and semis. So, but when we word started to get out, obviously the virus was happening and stuff, and there was um, so everyone we were back to work on Monday, but we sort of heard that things could shut down. So I rang all the uh, message all the heads of the department and said, listen, um, I've got five different scenarios. I want you to think about all you, uh, your department and how, um, what we can do in all of these scenarios. So the cool thing, they, we came in on Monday morning. We were supposed to be at 8.30 for the whole team. I delayed that to 1.30, brought all the head staff in, and we sat down and brain trust for two hours, all the different scenarios. So the first scenario, obviously, was that we normal training and playing. Um, to the worst case scenario, we we're in complete lockdown, can't even leave our houses. So from an SNC, rugby skills, medical, um, all the, the mental and so we put a massive plan. And the cool thing is that by Tuesday, lockdown came in, we'd planned to go from 1A to 1B, which was by training. And that changed quickly to 2A, which was we're into isolation, but we could still train, we just couldn't train together. And the really good thing about that is that we, we're just executing the plan that we had in place. And, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we catch up on, on uh, all the, we still have our staff meetings, we still have our routine. The boys have a system where they can check in um, with their symptoms, how they're feeling, which we have all the time anyway, which goes straight to the medical team, which um, sends everything out. We still have our coaches' meetings, we still do our players' meetings. So it's been really good. Uh, what about the Kiwis involved in your team? Um, you know, Charlie Piatau, Stephen Lutua, to name, uh, I guess, the more high-profile ones of them. How are they going? Yeah, very well. Obviously, Siali and Charles are in. Siali's got his family here and uh, Charles with his wife as well. And the, I think the big thing when you create a, a strong team culture, you know, it's not about just the bonding off the field. All the bonding off the field and the relationship building is for, generally, it's for when you're on the field, when you're, when you're in these tight matches and you have to push extra and you have to cover each other, make sacrifices of each other on the field. But now that applies even more into a situation like this. So it's, it's a real uh, sense of pride and, um, you know, watching the players and the way they connect. We broke all the team into eight groups because um, you have your normal social connection groups. But in those groups, there's about seven in each group. They 
every day they've got a touch base, whether it's a phone call. And we talked about once we get to the third week, make sure it's face to face, like I am here with you and let's get connected. Um, and, you know, um, I just go through the list and we just, everyone's just looking out for each other, which is, which is um, what it's supposed to be about. Mate, when I see Stephen Luatua play for, for, for you, for Bristol, he looks still every inch in all black. He, he's in wonderful form. Mate, he's gone another level, Stevie. You know, I made him the captain this year. He came in, um, you know, and he kept, you know, he wanted to get to know each other first. And But he, um, I knew the big thing was Stevie. And, and the beauty about here, we've got a really good S&C department and stuff. But when I sat down with Stevie, and the last time I saw him when, I, when we coached with the Blues, we looked at, you know, his goals, um, like we do with every player, where, you know, compare it against the best player in, in, in his position in the world and what's the gap, what we can do. We put a plan together. and um, But I think when you're over here, you know, he's well looked after and all things off the field. Um, so he's able to concentrate fully on his rugby development. And we've got a superb staff. And, and then the culture side of it, where Stevie feels really emotionally invested into uh, the Bristol Bears, the Bristol community, which is what... I sold all of them when they come here as the vision. If you want to just play rugby, get a payday, wrong, wrong place. If you want to come up here, we do a lot of work into the community. Our vision is inspiring our community. And the work they're doing out in the, out in the schools and the hospitals, it's fantastic. So, you know, I knew when they, when they came, um, you know, they've all, both him and Charles have re-signed, you know, and they re-signed because they were, um, you know, they, they loved the place. If they didn't, they would have left. Yeah, I look at him and think, man, he could easily walk back into an All Blacks team. I mean, he's he's easily good enough, isn't he? Well, when I was speaking with Eddie Jones and we we trained against the England team, and he said if these boys were English, he would take Steve Lua to uh, Chris Vui, you know, obviously the Charles Peter, you know, um, you know those, those boys there. I'm really proud, you know, the the, the Kiwis, the Island boys, you know, from pretty humble beginnings, and you know, and. They, they, they do a lot up here, but they invest a lot of their, their time and their, their finances into looking after their families back home. And that's what gives me a real sense of pride, you know, being a Pacific Islander as well. And, but it allows them to have massive smiles on their faces and just concentrate on what they love, playing the game. They know that they have to put the effort and work, and particularly, you know, Charles and Stevie, you know, um, you know and, and any Pacific Islander, if you, if you back off on the conditioning and staying fit and at your best, you're not going to perform. The natural talent will only take you so far. And, and you know, and the thing in New Zealand, because there is a lot of stress um, financially for some of these guys, it's, you know, it's very difficult to, to maintain, unless you're well looked after financially, to keep putting that effort in. Um, but this is not a concern for them. So all they can do is enjoy their rugby and, and you know, and we're seeing the benefit. They're, they're right at the top of their game and, and, uh, and I'm pleased for them. Yeah, Pat, finances are a big part of the game of rugby. Uh, they, both in New Zealand and obviously in England, they need to get back on the field. It would seem to me quite a straightforward process, wouldn't it, once you get the green light to play again, that you, your domestic competition is just going to start up again and, and that is what your fans really want anyway, is, is the domestic competition. Well, I think, you know, there's no doubt everyone's struggling and um, right around the world in the rugby because ultimately there's no income coming. You know, TV money, sponsors, you know, everything. And that we're no different from everyone else. You know, but I was saying to the players the other day is that if I could choose anywhere in the world, if I'm a professional rugby player or coach, to be, um, you know, where to be in this difficult situation, Bristol Bears, is where I'd want to be. The model that we have, obviously, Steve Lansdowne um, got a great relationship with him. And, you know, he's, um, what we've done, I would say if the club was still what it was like, you know, three, four years ago, um, there's a good chance that he would have left. But we, we've turned the club into a massive community club, into a place where there's massive inspiration and work, and which is, was his vision. And, um, and he, he sent a lot of pride. So the big thing over here, I, you know, it's going to be difficult. Some clubs might struggle to survive, you know, which is no different from elsewhere. But everyone's desperate to get back. But we don't know when that's going to be. But certainly coming back into our competition, the moment we start playing, the, the income can start coming in. Um, and we are, have the advantage that it's just domestic. It's all here. The premiership is, you know, it, it does generate a lot of money. But we just got to get back on the field. So... PRL have, and the RFU, they've got a plan for every scenario at the moment we get going. So um, they released, announced today that we will finish the season. 
and it's just a case of when all those restrictions are gone. Yeah, because the difference, uh, I think, within New Zealand is that if we go to a domestic competition, an enhanced NPC, as you and I always knew it, North and South games, those sorts of things, I think fans, a generation of fans, will need to be almost re-educated. They might not know the significance of Auckland Canterbury. You and I grew up loving it when Auckland beat Canterbury. Today's fans, they don't really have that same feeling. Yeah, I mean, the world's changed a lot from those days, you know, and, and, you know, and that's why, you know, the key, when I remember, you know, Stephen Brett um, coming up to when I was coaching the Blues. I mean, in my day, you, you know, you could talk about the blue and the white. You can talk about, you know, it's in my blood. You know, that's why when I got here, they used to have red for training. And I said, I don't want red. And we got blue now. You know, and they said, well, what did you like red? I said, red's Canterbury. You know, <laughs> we, we just grew up with that. And even when I went to play for the Crusaders, I loved, loved all of that and enjoyed that. But ultimately, you grow up. And that's the way we were brought up. But certainly, I remember having to talk to Stevie that I don't need you to be, I'm foolish to try and tell you you're a blue and white. You know, but it's, it, I need you to be loyal, not to blue and white, but to be loyal to the group and the team and what we're doing. And it's the same up here was everyone coming, not, not everyone. We have really good homegrown players, but all the guys that come in, it's about connecting them. That's why you connect them to the community so they understand who they represent. And you're exactly right. Exactly what I have to do here is educate the guys on what Bristol's about, what's a bit of the history, um, you know, get them into the, meet the kids, meet the, the people, the, the fans, so they get a real sense of um, who they are representing. So that's an interesting thing. Did you then, from a, I guess, an emotional and historic perspective, enjoy coaching Auckland perhaps more than the Blues? Mate, I, um, I loved, uh, the Auckland thing was, was, was massive because I played for Auckland. I yeah. came through, you know, I was, we were in the day where you play for your school, you play for your, your club, you know, St. Peter's, Marist, um, then you play, you know, and then if you're lucky to play for Auckland, and obviously I came through that great era of Auckland with legends in there. Um, and, you know, because we were the amateur day, but you would never, ever dream of going, you know, I remember when um, uh, I didn't, when I wanted to be a PE teacher, the reason I didn't go down, I was really struggling to go down there because you had to go to Otago in those days. And I could not see myself going to Otago. And there was Kerry Hill, uh, West, he was my Northern Regions coach. The, uh, um, and Kerry uh, was having a chat as a teacher to me as my coach. And he said to me, Pat, what do you want to do? I said, I really want to be a PE teacher, Pat. Uh, Kerry, but I don't want to go to Otago. You know, I was coming through the Auckland Colts and all that system. And he says, mate, do primary training. You can always go up, you can't go down. And that's how I ended up going to primary school teaching. And, uh, and it, was, it was the best thing ever, and not just pe but to be a primary school trainee. I don't think I'd be a coach if I hadn't gone through the uh, training as a primary school teacher. It's been massive, the skills that I learned from there and the enjoyment I got from that. So, um, then yeah, you, no. You went to North Harbour. I mean, that's almost worse. Yeah, well, that was, back, that was my auto back Shelford. <laughs> you know, because I came back from the World Cup and I knew at that stage too, you know, there's so many loose forwards and, and you know, I had committed at that stage, the 95 World Cup, that Samoa was going to be my, when I went from 91 for Samoa and I went for back to New Zealand and then I said to him, if I go back, I'll commit. And I'd made a big commitment to Samoa that I would um, stay with Samoa and do everything I can from uh, 94 onwards through the 95 World Cup, 99 and and uh, work at BG Williams and try and really improve everything. And Sir Michael Fay came on board. So that became my number one priority. So I knew then, you know, that I wasn't going to be around for some of the Auckland things. So there's no guarantee. And Buck Shelford came and had a word to me. And uh, he was assistant coach then. And, uh, you know, when Buck speaks to you, he's inspirational. And it's, you can't say no. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> what, yeah. what do you do? Buck says, Pat, I want you to play for North Harbour. Oh, mate, I'll have a little think about that. No, you won't, son. No, you won't. <laughs> No, he was great. I, I you know, even, even when I, if I, if I listened to him talking, I was always inspired by Buck. And, uh, you know, and I remember my first game, um, my first debut was against Auckland at Honourable Domain, and we won. Uh, and I got player of the day that day too. And it was, uh, I remember Fitzy giving a few kicks, giving me a few words, you know, a few, a few rubbed me up a bit, you know, to say, uh, you don't leave Auckland, buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. professional days then. You know, that was different. It was different from the amateur. Everyone was moving. To get yeah, a game. Absolutely, absolutely. Mate, do you ever see yourself coming back home and coaching? Do you ever do you think you'd coach back in New Zealand again? It was interesting. You know, when I when I came through as a coach and I was blessed, like I transitioned 
even when I was playing, you know, Ian McGeekin gave me the opportunity with Scotland as, as I still had a playing contract. So I went for, you know, two years of, with Scotland and then transitioned and then I was supposed to co be assistant Graham Henry after the 2003 World Cup, you know, rang me and said, right, I'm going to go for the Auckland job and I want you to be my assistant coach. Well, great, looking forward to it. That's, that was me coming home. Yep. And then suddenly All Blacks lost to um, Australia. John Mitchell's job was up. Graham was going for the Auckland job and I thought, oh, I'm buggered now. And then I got a call from the Auckland board asking me to now apply for the the, um, the head coach role. And, you know, and, and I loved all of that. But I, all my dream coming through then, you're always like, okay, like rugby, you go the next level, go the next level. Yeah. What I learned from my time with the Blues um, uh, was when I, um, when I got sacked from the Blues, I mean, I loved my time at the Blues and it was my greatest learning because you're able to reflect, go back and go, okay, you know, 2011 was an unbelievable year. You know, I mean, it's funny. You know, they talk about my 2012 year, which was good. And they just talk about the 2011, the last time they made the playoffs. Yeah. They, never mentioned, they never mentioned who coached that year. And, um, but in that 2012 year, um, things, a lot of things happened that I took stock, came back and said, right, okay. One thing I'll do when I get back into coaching, right? Because some people get sacked and they never come back. And I knew that was my, the biggest learnings I took away from that. I will never, ever take another job unless I have real clarity on the vision of the job I'm going to take. And more importantly, that whoever wants me to do this job, if I apply, gives real clarity on what I, what I do. I realized the Blues is my only job ever, whether it's teaching or coaching, I never had to interview for. I never had to apply for. I just got told after the success of Auckland, uh, Pat, we want you to coach the Blues. Here's your salary. This is what it's going to do. And, mate, it's my hometown, super rugby. Yeah, great. So I never got that. Once I got into the job, I realized there's a lot of things I could not control, which affect the, um, which was affecting the job. And although I was the front person, front and center, and, and likewise, because what happens on the field is ultimately what's going to be judged for the whole organization. That's what coaching is. What I learned very quickly that I've been unfortunate to be in some really successful teams um, playing and coaching, but I've also been blessed to be in some horrific teams. And the things I took away from there, there was three things that are non-negotiable. Number one is you've got to have a game, a game that's independent of players that can beat any teams, all right? And I believe the game and what my knowledge of the game and how we can play the game is massive. Now, I'll never bring it down to the players. The players have to come up, which is why you need a good staff. But the second thing is you've got to have a culture that is so strong and that people enjoy coming. Because you can have a fantastic game. But if people don't enjoy being together, you'll never be able to achieve things. Likewise, you can have a fantastic culture. Everyone loves coming to work, but your game's not going to win rugby. Mm. And the third one is you've got to have leadership. Because if this is going to be an ongoing, successful thing over year, year, rather than one-hit wonders, is that you've got to be bringing the next people through. You've got to be growing people and influence and lead. So those are the three things. So I came away from that and wrote, right, um, I had six months to find a job because I was going to be unemployed. Um, I was, Samo asked me to get involved. And then I got a lot of um, agent, gave me, a lot of things came up. And I had about eight different options that I could take. The job I took was Connect. Mm. No, it was, honestly, there were some big names that I could have gone to. But I asked all of them, what's your vision? And the vision that really appealed to me was Connex. And then I was able to do an interview and talk about, if I'm going to come here, and I love the vision because it's more than a game. It was about community. It was about, you know, which is what, what I was about in the amateur day. And then the other thing, too, that I was able to say, I ne if you want me just to coach rugby, wrong guy. I can't come. I need to be able to lead and influence the culture and the leadership of the place and the game. And so um, that was massive. The biggest, so we, obviously, we went on and we built a team and we did a, we did a little bit of a Leicester, like in football where no one, I mean, we had, honestly, we had Connacht had the smallest budget in all the professional teams in the Northern Hemisphere. But what we did is we built the game, the culture and the leadership. We came through and surprised everyone. But the problem was, is that the finances of the place was so unstable because, again, the budget was going to change, expectations are going up. That result, I got a knock on the door from um, Bristol Bears. And they were struggling, really struggling. You only have to look at what they were doing. They had a billionaire owner Steve Lansdowne so Steve and his wife flew over to West of Ireland met me and Steph and he asked me that he'd like me to come and do what I've done in Connacht I said Steve firstly um, do you understand what I do and more importantly I need to know what you want and he said look because he's a football man but he said look Pat 
um, yeah, I'm a football man. However, I'm also a sport man and I understand what sport can do in a community. He started talking about Bristol. He's a Bristolian. He started, he's self-made. He talked about Bristolian people, the city and his pride in the city. And I was like, wow. And then, um, and then I got an opportunity to say the same thing. Steve, I know you look at the game. It's not that if I'm going to come here, I need to, the whole organisation, be able to lead in culture, game and, and leadership. And he said, yeah, great. Those are the things that I didn't have influence with. And I'm talking not just the players and staff, the whole organisation, the admin staff, everybody. So everyone might answer to different people, um, you know, different line managers. But when it comes to a culture thing or a leadership thing, that's where, you know, um, that I can influence and bring things in and also stop things coming in that are going to affect the culture, affect the leadership. The other thing I did say in that too, I said, Steve, if I do come here, I'm only going to answer to you, um, you know. And, and also the, his best friend, who's the chairman, who was the part owner as well, uh, Chris Boy, who's, who's the rugby man. Those two are best mates. So I'm in a dream job where I don't have any agendas or politics. I've got two guys who are self-made men. These guys who are passionate about the city, the rugby. I laid out a five-year plan. They tick it off. And um, recruitment, retention, everything I'm able to influence. And, and again, I don't have to answer to, to, a, you know, to a CEO or a or a board and go through all this red tape. If I think that Charles Piertel is the right one, I put it through the coaching group, we discuss it, and then I can go and I'll ask Charles, you know, would you like to come and here's, here's the offer. Of course we have a budget, and I, and, but I, um, I, I just do all the work through that and manage all that. So it's, I am in a dream job, and that's why if people, I've been offered, um, you know, if I'd apply for different international jobs, but the job I'm in at the moment, I don't see any reason why I should apply because, um, you know, when you're able to influence rugby um, culture, leadership, um, you've got a, um, a very supportive owner and you answer to the owner, it's, it's great. Oh, so you're not going to come back and coach Auckland back to their former glory. That's a bit disappointing, mate, I've got to say. Oh, you never say you never say never, mate. You know, like you never know what's you know, even when I was when I was coaching there that I think I was gonna get sacked now when I was you know, I don't you never know what's around the corner, you know, only, only the big fella knows, you know. But for me at the moment, um, you know, I'm I'm very blessed to be where I am. And as I was saying, if you know, when you're in a you know, rugby's going for a financial um issue at the moment, as I said to the players, you know, I think you've got to count your blessings that you're you're contracted to the Bristol Bears. Because we have an owner that, you know, he's under, of course, you know, like everybody, he's under the same stress. But, you know, we're, we're in a far better place than some other teams and, and other unions. Do you want to coach the All Blacks? You know, again, it'd be the same thing. You know, it's the All Blacks is, is, uh, is, is a, um, you know, um, is without a doubt one of my favourite teams. You know, it's it's... And, and you look at that level. But for me, you look at, it's not about coaching the All Blacks. It's about what is the role? What does it entail? What sort of influence can you have? You know, and one of the things that was massive in that Blues last year, I didn't have influence on a lot of key things to get the job done. I am only as good as the people around me. When you aren't able to have the people around you, and you're expected, and the resources that you need to get it done, and you can't get the job done through that. People don't care about all that at the end, as I quickly found out. You know, I found people that were telling me, oh, it's okay, you know, we can do this. They, they turned around after and say, look at the results. But the results and everything comes back to the process. And process, you need good people. And you need to be able to hire the right people um, and to be able to control. Because as I said when I left, you know, I was in the front line taking all the shots, you know, and I had no problem with that because it, 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 it developed me into a far better coach. But what I didn't expect was the bullets to come from, from within. And that was the, uh, and so I'm very guarded and to make sure everything's laid at front. And I, I'm telling you, some of the jobs that I could have, if I asked, even if I asked you and I said, right, Bristol, or if I gave you a couple of other jobs that I could have taken, 99.9% of people say that job or connect or this job, but no, I did my work and I made sure that that's really clear. And I, and coaches, always ask me for advice. I said, never take a job, just for a job, do your homework, make sure everything's upfront and there's clarity. So you don't get caught in the middle of it where you can't control a lot of things that are going to affect your destination. So is that a yes or a no with the All Blacks? You never say never. You never say never. I think, you know, the All Blacks um, and New Zealand rugby is going through some massive changes. You know, the game, 
you know, at the end of the day, it, it started when young players started to leave and, you know, and that's, yeah, but this could, I can see this is going to, this whole coronavirus is going to be a massive shake up in world rugby everywhere. You know, if there's changes to be made now, is it the global calendar? Is it different competitions? Because ultimately people are going to need income, but people want to, so everything that people have said, oh, you know, it's going to be, things need changing. Now's the time to do it. And I think we can't really make those changes till we assess when rugby comes, when everything gets back to normality. Then we've got to have to assess the damage and then we're going to assess who survived, like businesses. The businesses that survive will thrive, you know. The people that survive will thrive. And it's the rugby clubs, unions, the ones that survive, then they can start influencing the future of the game for the best of the game. Yeah, it's going to be a, a very different landscape when we come out of this coronavirus. Pat, always good to catch up, mate. Wonderful to see you and wonderful to have a chat. It's funny, mate. Just the, I'm just watching when we started, you were darker. I was lighter. My sun's going down. You know, it's, it's pretty much the moon's on its way up now. And I'm watching the sun come down there. It's uh, technology and uh, it's awesome. And, uh, you know, I just want to say to everyone in New Zealand too, stay safe. You know, I've got, you know, obviously families and friends, but more importantly, connect, look after each other and don't take it for granted that everyone's all right. You know, a phone call or FaceTime makes a huge difference. God bless everyone.